Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is David Shankland. I'm the director of the Law and Anthropological Institute. And it's a great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Bardis Madawi, who is really going to talk about uh, her own uh, uh, development as, as, as an anthropologist and as, a, and, and as a writer through this wonderful trope of, of hyphen. And certainly, certainly I, we completely take on board at the Institute the importance of hyphens. When we reconstituted our ethnomusicology committee about a decade ago, it was made extremely clear uh, during the first meeting that after many years of careful debate, the ethnomusicological community had decided that they would not have a hyphen in their name. Uh, and so once this extremely important matter was clear, we could get on with the business of restarting the committee, which was a great success. But once that first point was clarified, indeed, there were no further misunderstandings. And so um, I can certainly understand uh, why that can be so significant within our community. But of course, uh, we're talking about uh, very, very important matters here. And uh, uh, I look forward very, very much to learning more and, and, and sharing your thoughts with you as well as the audience. So, so, so please, Pardis, the, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. And thank you to Hanina and Amanda and the Royal Anthropological Institute for hosting me. Uh, today. Uh, good morning to you all from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, good afternoon to those of you in London. Good evening to our friends a bit further uh, east. Um, and thank you all for joining me. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here uh, to introduce to you my book, Hyphen. Um, and uh, lest there be any confusion or misunderstanding, uh, this book, it is about the hyphen as an orthographic mark but it actually is an ethnographic study. Um, so it actually is living at the, in, like the hyphen and like hyphenated individuals like myself, Iranian American, uh, many of us who are hyphenated. Um, the book lives at the intersection of ethnography and orthography. Um, and this was sort of my venture uh, uh, into looking at how the history of a tiny orthographical mark like the hyphen is actually so, so richly intertwined with the everyday experiences of hyphenated individuals around the world. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hope that our colleagues will be kind enough to let me know if for some reason the screen share didn't happen, um, but we'll just uh, hope that it did. Okay, great. And if it didn't, someone can just wave their hand at me or something. No, it looks great. Excellent, thank you so much for, the, uh, for letting me know. You know one never knows, right? Uh, okay, so I'm sort of tentatively titling my talk, hyphen, ethnography in the in-between, um, because I feel that this experience of writing this book, of what I call a crossover book, um, is, has been a really interesting um, journey through liminality and finding belonging, even as an anthropologist, even as a, as a writer. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the book is part of a series called Object Lessons. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these books, but um, they're all kind of similar in, in format. So this is of course hyphen, but you can compare, they're all, this is Blackface by Ayanna Thompson, another ASU professor. I'm just kind of giving you some examples. So you can see there, on, this is High Heels, one of my favorites. This is Hotel, similar in size and, and structure. Um, and, and in terms of kind of tone, they're a really interesting uh, crossover experience for academics wanting to reach a larger audience through their expertise. And so I'll talk a little bit more ab about that as well. So just a, a brief overview of, of our, our time together today. Um, I wanted to start with uh, some contemplations and reflections on the ethnographic pre-terrain. Um, I've been thinking a lot about ethnographic pre-terrain and post-terrain. Um, as that, you know, as the pre-terrain leads up to the field work and then leading up to even the writing of the book, that experience of the in-between as you're writing and then crossing over um, from the field work to, to the written work. And then of course the ethnographic post-terrain. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my experiences in the ethnographic post-terrain with regards to my previous work. Um, some of you know, and it certainly is in this book that uh, I paid a very heavy price for my ethnographic work in Iran, which is that the post terrain of my ethnographic, my ethnography, Passionate Uprisings, Iran Sexual Revolution, 
I paid a very heavy price, which is that I was arrested and expelled from my native country. So I've been thinking a lot about notions of the ethnographic pre-terrain and post-terrain. And so we'll explore a little bit of that today. And, and then I wanted to, to end with a reading, um, some, of, some of my favorite passages uh, from, from the book. So this is just a sense of some of my work up until now. Many of you already, uh, I, I've seen some old friends in the chat. Thank you for being here. Um, Passionate Uprisings was my first book uh, about Iran's sexual revolution. I did seven years of ethnographic field work in Iran. Um, I would say that the pre-terrain there was riddled with the politics of entering Iran as an ethnographer post-revolution. I was among the first to do that. Uh, and of course, getting all the approvals, going through all the challenges of entering uh, uh, a country uh, that has really experienced a bit of a, a lockdown in many ways. The pre-terrain was riddled with the entry. Um, and, and then of course, you know, the, there's the book, and then the post-terrain was, of course, the response to the book, which, you know, um, many, many Iranians uh, and, and others around the world sort of wrote to me and said, well, this is, thank goodness somebody's sort of writing about this, but of course the government was not as, as pleased with the book. Um, so I was, you know, then I became an anthropologist without a field site. I was kicked out of my native country and my field site. Um, and so some of the work I'd done in Iran had been with sex workers. Uh, and uh, so I started following them to Dubai. Had a very interesting experience in Dubai um, because most of the sex workers I interviewed um, did not understand or describe themselves as we would think about being trafficked, the women. The men, however, and if you've been to Dubai, you've seen it, the men who were working in migrant labor very much were trafficked. And this was a time where there was a very heavily gendered discourse around human trafficking. Uh, and so, you know, my next uh, several books were really looking at these intersections of gender, sexuality, labor, migration in the Middle East um, and then across Asia, um, where, the, again, the ethnographic free terrain was, you know, also uh, certainly contoured by questions around access um, and, and questions around, you know, had to be very reflexive about my positionality in entering the field. Um, the pre-terrain was probably a bit more challenging than the post-terrain uh, for all my books after Iran. Uh, but so it's, it's something I've really been reflecting on a lot. And particularly with this book, it, 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 it really kind of resonated with me thinking about the pre-terrain of a book that is really um, located in a different field site than I ever had before. I mean, this book is really, you know, draws from my autoethnography, but also field work with with my students who are hyphenated Americans over the years. Uh, and then I, I delved into orthography. So, you know, just to kind of get us all on the same page, you know, I'm working with the definition of the ethnographic pre-terrain as put forward by Peter Pels, who introduces a new emphasis in the process of field work um, called the ethnographic pre-terrain, which he defines as an exploration of the trajectories from which ethnographers enter the field. And so that can be, everything from the, the experiences and the methodologies of reflexivity and positionality, even in thinking about your topic. And here, of course, I'm very, my work is very informed. My thinking is informed by the work of Renato Rosaldo um, and of course, Paul Rabinow and Jean Jeanette Briggs. Um, and, and, and reflexivity and positionality being one part of the pre-terrain. But then of course, there's this question of how does one even enter quote unquote the field and as the field changes. Um, for this book, I've been thinking a lot about the pre-terrain as a liminal anthropologist, what, what the trajectory that brought me into the field of, of this particular question was a feeling of liminality myself, right? A liminal anthropologist. So I was, was an anthropologist turned administrator, um, kind of trying to find my, my footing, really missing the field work, really missing the method, the rigor of all the work that I was doing. And, and also kind of trying to find a sense of belonging for myself as an Iranian American in the, in the era of Donald Trump. Um, you know, how do you be Iran and America in one body when these are two countries that have been um, narrated as diametrically opposed? Uh, and, and so, you know, there was the politics of the moment. There was also the, the, the politics of my own kind of trajectory as, as, as an anthropologist who had waded into a pool of, of, of administration, you know, for, for a time. And, and really just thinking a lot about the question of the hyphen. And so I, I started to actually explore, you know, the politics of the hyphen itself. 
And the more I delved into the history of the hyphen, the more it resonated with <clears throat> my own experiences as a hyphenated American, but also as a hyphenated you know, anthropologist come administrator. I mean, I, I feel like I, I hit so many hyphens, like, like many of the people, um, m many folks who are probably on this call and, and, and many of the folks with whom I've, I've done field work, people see their identities as multi-hyphenates, uh, as many folks would say. And um, so I started to explore the, the history and the politics of the hyphen. And if you just go back to, to World War II, um, what you see is this notion of hyphen as divider. And there's this anti-hyphenate uh, hyphenism and it, it kind of really, it takes root in World War II. You've got people like FDR and Woodrow Wilson and, and Winston Churchill saying a hyphenated person. So in, in the American case, FDR, and FDR has a very famous quote. He says, a hyphenated American is not an American. And there's a, a famous song called the hyphen by John Wayne, for those of you uh, John Wayne fans. And he actually, it's in my book, I quote it, and he, he talks about how there is no such thing as a hyphenated American. Hy a hyphenated American signals divided loyalty uh, during the wartime. And so this was this sort of anti-hyphenism moment that stirred up this controversy to drop the hyphen in everything. So those of you who are avid readers of the New York Times, you may or may not know, but it was written always as new hyphen York Times. There was always a hyphen in New York as there was in New Jersey. Um, but it was around this time that there was this anti-hyphenism. And so I could sort of see that anti-hyphenism. Um, but the further back you go, and actually when you learn about, when I started learning about the origins of the hyphen, the hyphen was created by Dionysus Thrax, the ancient Greek grammarian wandering the halls of the Alexandria library. And he was trying to find a way uh, to, to write words, to signal two separate words that belonged together. So this was a time when the written word was not spoken, but sung. And Thrax was trying to find a way to signal that these were words that belonged together. Fast forward to um, Gutenberg, another person who made the hyphen famous, uh, in his printing of the Gutenberg Bible, wanted to find ways that he could keep the justification on the page, but signal words that belonged together, again, using the hyphen. So that was what kind of piqued my interest. This was part of the pre-terrain. I was more pulled in when I started actually looking at the stories of people like Gutenberg and like Dionysus Thrax themselves. And these were individuals and other individuals I introduced throughout history and in the book who themselves struggled with belonging. Gutenberg is most well known for the Gutenberg Bible. He came from a family of blacksmiths, but he really wanted to be a poet. So he was a blacksmith hyphenate poet. He also found himself hyphenated in all these different ways. He invented the printing press in order to marry and bring together the two sides of him. And so these were all kind of the experiences and the information and, and what the learning that, that really informed the pre-terrain of, of the work. So as I mentioned, the further back you go, the more you see the hyphen is something that connects. Now, when you hit World War II, the hyphen is narrated as something that divides. That's when the hyphen gets dropped. Fast forward to 2006, our colleagues in the UK will remember when the Shorter Oxford English Dictionary came out in 2006, there was a big controversy and people said there's a hyphen thief on the loose because the hyphen was removed from some 16,000 words. Now, there was a critique, is the hyphen no longer useful? But when you actually delve into the work that the editors of the SOED did, and when you actually delve into the work of the hyphen, what you see is that the hyphen actually ends up being a way station, which also itself is a hyphenated, was a hyphenated word. So way station was two separate words, way, space, station. The hyphen was introduced to signal that these are words that belong together, way, hyphen, station. Today, it's now just way station, one word. Um, you have many examples of this. Uh, so for instance, you have um, bumblebee. Bumblebee was bumble space B, then it was bumble hyphen B, and then now it's bumblebee. It was removed in 2006, the hyphen was removed. Now, is that a, a, an indication that the hyphen is no longer useful? No, it actually is a part of the journey of the hyphen in that it's not a, necessarily a divider. It is a connector, but really what it is, is it's something that creates something else altogether. 
So the hyphen as a way station created something else altogether. And that for me was a really important turning point where I understood that as a hyphenated individual, I didn't have to live on one side or the other of the hyphen. I didn't have to see myself as fitting in Iranian or American, but I could live inside the hyphen. I could live in that in between because that creates something new altogether. So that was the sort of the pre-train. It was that those discoveries that brought me then into the autoethnographic work and then the ethnographic work. Um, so I had been conducting ethnography with uh, young people, uh, particularly my students at ASU, but also young people who identified as hyphenated Americans for a long time. It was part of a larger study called the New American Conversation. What are the new, who are the new Americans? Who are we and, and how do we understand ourselves? Uh, particularly became salient at, a, a, salient at ASU, uh, a university that defines itself as the new American university. Um, so I, I, I started delving into you know, the experiences of, of my interlocutors. And I really focused, and I'm focusing on three, whose of course names have been changed, but um, I, I, I end up focusing on Jaden Anaya and, and Adachike. And, and these, are, these are young people who are all hyphenated Americans um, who experience their hyphenism in, in very, very different ways. Uh, and you know, I, I, I go through their, their lives that parallel with mine. Um, and I was trying to find a way to tell their story and to interweave their story, not only with mine, but with the orthography. And what I found was their own stories, like mine, were very much almost like a, a trajectory in three parts. So you, you have a part of their, their experiences where they feel the hyphen as something that divides them. Um, that makes them feel, do I, I have to pick one side or the other? I'm a divided self. I'm neither here nor there. Those experiences of liminalities. Then you actually have a kind of a second part of their lives where they talk about, and myself as well, where they talk about the hyphen is bringing the two sides of themselves together as connector. And then finally, there's this moment of release that I also experienced in the, in the writing of the book, in the crossing over, if you will where the understanding that actually we didn't have to be one thing or the other divided or connected, we could be something else altogether. Now, people talk a lot about third culture kids, et cetera, et cetera, but it's this notion of the journey of the hyphen, the journey of the hyphenated as, as being able, as having a freedom to be something else altogether. So then my next task was how to interweave the ethnography and the orthography. And really my goal was to bring the hyphens past into the future of the hyphenated, which is then what I ended up doing in the book. So the book interweaves the stories of people like Dionysus Thrax, like Gutenberg, like FDR and John Wayne. And it interweaves those with the stories of my interlocutors as well as uh, autoethnography. And that to me was creating something else altogether like the hyphen does. It was sort of an homage or doing justice to the hyphen by creating something else altogether. My next challenge, of course, was writing in between. And so as I've mentioned already, Object Lessons is a series that really is about that in between, you know, in between kind of writing. Now, don't mistake their size for the topics that, that people take on. So I have, again, Ayana Thompson's book, Blackface. Blackface is, of course, a very complex and heavy topic. So don't mistake the size, but here you have a scholar who has been studying um, blackface over you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, and she's making it accessible to people, having a conversation around how we weave the past into the present and the future. And, and these books are an exercise in writing in between, in crossing over, in writing for a different audience, and, and, and writing for an interdisciplinary audience. And, this then became very resonant for me because it seemed like it was the perfect home for a book called Hyphen. Um, hyphen is an object, yes, in the abstract. Um, is it an object held? Not necessarily, but the book is definitely an object held. Uh, so that seemed to me um, like the best way to do that crossover. So then the ethnographic post-terrain. Uh, has, since the book has come out, has allowed me to reflect uh, on how I, I reflected and what my position was coming in. But also I'm, I'm always very 
um, uh, thoughtful and intentional about the responses to the book uh, and how we think about you know, this kind of writing, if it resonates, does it resonate with anthropologists? Does it resonate with non-anthropologists? One of the things that was interesting for me to learn is that it was particularly resonant with philosophers, which I never would have predicted, um, but also that it kind of brought me into this world of orthography and grammar files. And I hadn't ever you know, been in that world. And so it brought me into a different field, if you will, um, and, and really brought me into conversation uh, with new audiences and, and, and new discourses. And so I, I think one of the most salient things for me is that this ethnographic post-terrain has been probably the most fulfilling post-terrain of all the books I've written. Um, and I've been trying to reflect on why that is. Is it the writing? Is it the object itself as being something no, no larger than an iPhone that feels you know you can delve into, is it that there's connection? But that's kind of where, where I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the pre-terrain for me was a lot about struggle. The writing was kind of finding my way and then the post-terrain has been a release, very similar to the architecture of the actual book. So, you know, it does get a bit meta reflecting on reflexivity, but I do think that it's important to think through the, the ethnographic uh, pre and, and post-terrain. So I'm going to do uh, a, a reading and I, I'm going to stop the share so that so that I can um, see you all. Uh, and I'm going to read just a few passages from the book, uh, if you'll permit me. Um, and then I'm really eager to hear your thoughts and questions uh, and, and, and your, your responses and, you know, how, how you see the ethnographic pre and post terrain of a book like this, but how, how that resonates or doesn't uh, with your own work. So um, I thought I'd actually read um, the, the preface because I think it sets up uh, the book really probably the, the best you know, way and, and gives you a sense for the feel, the tone and the texture of it. To hyphenate or not to hyphenate has been a central point of controversy since before the imprinting of the first Gutenberg Bible. And yet the hyphen has persisted, bringing and bridging new words and concepts. The journey of this humble piece of connective punctuation reveals the quiet power of an orthographic concept to speak to the travails of hyphenated individuals all over the world. For me, it took being kicked out of my ancestral home to wrap my limbs around the hyphen. As a hyphenated Iranian American growing up betwixt and between, I have struggled to find or make belonging. I've learned that I'm not alone. Like many others whom I introduce in this book, I have learned that I don't have to fit on one side of the hyphen or the other, but rather I can embrace the space between. So many others like me have finally found a way to embrace their voice and authority inside the hyphen itself. I invite you to join us to see how the journey of a hum humble gra grammatical marker has the potential to make belonging for hyphenated individuals struggling through identity politics from the ancient times to today. So I wanted to read um, from the origins of the hyphen. I wanted to read to you a bit about Dionysus Thrax. Uh, this is chapter two for, for those of you who actually have the book. Um, chapter one is actually a bit of autoethnography and it talks about my own experiences as an Iranian American and what informed the writing of this book. Um, really the pre-terrain, which, which I've already talked through with you all, but this is chapter two. Dionysus Thrax, the tax evading second century Greek grammarian. And yes, I did try to throw in as many hyphens into this book as possible. So tax evading second century, yes. The tax evading second century Greek grammarian gave birth to the hyphen when he was caught between two worlds himself. Should he be spending his time adding to punctuation rules that his teacher, Aristarchus, he of asterisk fame, asked him to refine? Or should he give in to his heart's desire to focus on the spoken word? As he roamed the halls of the Library of Alexandria, he realized that he didn't have to choose, he could do both. And so the hyphen was born. As Thrax looks, looked at the words that filled the expensive parchment paper surrounding him, he was concerned. There were no spaces. How would a reader or a singer, as readers often preferred to sing the text, know where to put the emphasis on certain words. How would they know what words belonged together? What words needed to be joined? Drax set to work on an essay entitled Technique Grammatique, or The Art of Grammar, 
In this piece, he focused on the state of the art of grammar, exploring the construction of words and introducing possibilities for new constructions. Drax drew inspiration from his teacher, Aristarchus, as well as Ar Aristarchus's mentor, Aristophanes, who was known as the father of Greek punctuation. Techni became an instant success and the scribal practices that Thrax suggested would be adopted and employed by Greek scribes for centuries to come. In the opening section of his essay, Thrax focused on prosody, or the spoken delivery of written text. He introduced new punctuation that would facilitate the delivery, rhythms, and intonation of the written word for speakers and singers alike. After introducing the apostrophe, to clarify syllable boundaries that were ambiguous and the comma-like hypodiastal that would separate concepts, Thrax gave us the hyphen, a U-like construction. So the first hyphen was a U, kind of a bow underneath. A U-like construction placed under adjacent words that clarified for the speaker that the words should be understood and spoken as a single entity. The hyphen, the apostrophe, and the hypodiastal became vital components of writing and speaking to bring clarity for the reader and speaker in interpreting the author's intent. Rax's hyphen, which would later be renamed a sublinear hyphen because it was used as a small bow shape, remained in popular use in Greek texts for centuries. But like many other casualties of empire, the Greeks would see their beloved hyphen robbed, ransacked, and reformed by the brutal Romans some 300 years later. Like many other unfortunate social transformations, it was a combination of colonialism and capitalism that took the hyphen from a magical marker to show belonging in word construction to a facilitator for eighth century non-native speaking scribes who did not want to procure new parchment paper when they made mistakes in order to keep the costs of texts low. While the Romans had initially adopted the Greek writing practice of writing without spaces, instead it was, you know, causing them to remove the dots they had previously put to separate the words. By the eighth century, Celtic monks who were struggling with the unspaced Latin texts found a new use for the hyphen that the Romans would quickly adopt. The Celtic scribes struggled to pry apart smashed together words and concepts that their non-Latin speaking linguistic skills could not grasp. In turn, they broke up and inserted words in error dividing texts in an attempt to make sense of them. In this process, they made mistakes. But rather than start their writing over or procuring a new piece of stone or parchment, they decided to make a new purpose for the hyphen, to divide and conquer. They used the hyphen to divide words or concepts that they did not understand and to cover up their errors. The scribes found it was easier to use their razors to erase and, and then cover up with a straight line placed in the middle. And thus the elegant sublinear bow-shaped U hyphen that was used to fuse words together was erased and replaced with a straight line divisional marker of punctuation. This would then be codified in the Gutenberg Bible centuries later, much to the chagrin of the Greeks who felt an important part of their past erased by what they considered to be a hostile takeover of a previously loved grammatical mark. Some 2000 years later, when Tula Portugalis' father Gus in the popular film, My Big Fret, that Greek wedding would claim that everything was invented by the Greeks. Hyphenophiles who knew the real story of their orthographic marker would sign an agreement, mourning for Dionysus Thrax and his dreams for the hyphen. So there you get sort of that interweaving of, of Thrax's story. Now I want to introduce uh, one of the interlocutors um, so you get a sense for, for how we kind of move between orthography and ethnography. So I'm gonna introduce you to Anaya. So chapter six is uh, entitled Like Water for Chocolate. The rich aroma of chocolate and spices filled the kitchen as Anaya stirred the mole, careful not to let the edges burn in her mother's cast iron pot. She cleaned the chicken breasts and turned to chopping the onions, letting the tears flow from her eyes with every cut. Each time she chopped onions, she felt like Tita, the main character in her favorite book, like water for chocolate, or she insisted on referring to it como agua para chocolate. She had watched the cooking scenes from the movie over and over, practicing how Esquivel's characters rolled letters off their tongues. What exactly are you doing? Came her mother's voice, snapping Anaya out of her reverie. Anaya wiped the tears from her eyes, careful to use her wrist so as not to get any traces of onion on her face. Sniffled. Are you crying? Her mother demanded. 
Mommy, as Tita says, the problem with crying while chopping onions isn't the crying. It's that sometimes one starts crying and can't stop. Don't call me mommy. It's mom or mother, you know that. And there you go, quoting that stupid movie again, her mother said. It's a book, mom. And I interjected. Whatever. And are you making chicken with that chocolate sauce again? Her mother asked. Mommy, you know what it is and how to say it. It's mole. And I corrected her mother. Her mother rolled her eyes. I wish you would snap out of it, Anaya, her mother said. Snap out of what? My culture? Who I am? A proud Mexicana? Anaya shot back. You're American. Don't forget that. I'd rather forget, Anaya snapped back. Plus, it's technically your fault, all of this. Anaya could tell her mother wasn't exactly sure what her daughter was accusing her of. When Anaya was only three years old, her mother had fled violence in their hometown of Oaxaca de Juarez, the capital of the state of Oaxaca, and crossed the border into southern Arizona. Along with her two older brothers, Anaya had grown up in a small town near the border. When Anaya was young, her mother worked as a cleaning lady and would bring her daughter along with her to clean many of the houses at which she worked. While her mom vacuumed or did laundry, Anaya would sneak into the rooms of the owner's young children, the owner's young children to read their books. For a time, she had been enamored with the Junie B. Jones series, following the young protagonist on misadventures and living vicariously through Junie's confidence in challenging the adults in her life. Then Anaya started following Ramona Quimby and later the Harry Potter series. But something always felt missing in those books. None of them featured heroes or heroines who looked or sounded like her. Sure, she could relate to Hermione Granger's smarts, Ramona Quimby's practicality, and Junie B. Jones's sense of adventure. But why wasn't she, Anaya, reflected in any of these pages? Where were the Mexican queens, the Venezuelan princesses, the Colombian heroes? When she was 10 years old, Anaya accompanied her mother to the home of a new employer. She was disappoint disappointed to find that the house hosted no children, searching various rooms for any sign of children's books and finding nothing. An hour into her search, she stumbled into a home office. There she found several bookcases filled with colorful and interesting sounding books, but one stood out, a bright blue cover with a Oaxacan painting on the front. She pulled at the spine and the book tumbled into her hands, like water for chocolate by Laura Esquiva. And I could barely contain her excitement as she turned the pages of this sumptuous book. Here was something she could sink her teeth into. Here was a book that tickled all of her senses and made her feel alive, feel belonging. When her mother had finished cleaning the house, she called to Anaya from the front door and announced it was time to go home. Only halfway through the book, Anaya could not bear to part with her newfound treasure. She bit her lip as she stuffed the book up her shirt and pulled the sweater, her sweater closed, shut. She hesitated for a moment before heading to the door. If her mother found out she had stolen something from a client, she'd be furious. But on the other hand, how could Anaya not take this book home? After all, the book was practically speaking directly to her, calling her. She crossed her arms over her chest, clutching the book closer to her body as she slunk out of the house and climbed into her mother's car. She didn't speak to her mother the whole way home out of fear that she would be caught. Her mother had taken her silence as a symbol of her daughter's enduring anger. Earlier that year, Anaya's mother had come home one evening with a tall stranger. This man, named Robert, was introduced as their father-to-be. While her brothers had stormed out of the house, Anaya had just stood there, studying the man. His straight blonde hair and crystal blue eyes, a sharp contrast to everything she loved about her mother, from her thick, curling black hair to her warm brown eyes. Even worse, Robert did not speak any Spanish. And from that day on, her mother had banned anyone in the family from speaking their native tongue. The ultimate insult in Anaya's eyes was that Robert robbed them of their culture. Anaya's mother stopped cooking Oaxacan food, instead favoring dishes she knew Robert preferred like meatloaf or pasta primavera. At night, Anaya could hear her mother working to rid herself of her Spanish accent. Over the years, Anaya's mother would struggle with this task, but in an ironic twist of fate, Anaya was the first to lose her native tongue, being the youngest member of the family. By the time she was 13, she would remember only the few words of Spanish she pried out of her favorite work, favorite book, Como Agua para Chocolate. It wasn't until some years after Anaya's transgression that her mother discovered what her daughter had done. She was cleaning Anaya's room and found the book under her daughter's bed, pages folded and bent, the front tattered. By that point, their relationship had become so painfully strained that her mother's anger had little bearing on Anaya. Anaya's mother had married Robert before Anaya's 11th birthday and by then had changed almost everything about herself, becoming almost unrecognizable to her children. 
she had changed the pronunciation of her first name from Claudia, pronounced Claudia, to the anglicized Claudia, with the middle syllable seemingly swallowed. When her mother announced that she was changing her last name to Smith to match her husband's, Anaya had refused to change hers, clinging onto Lopez fiercely. And while her mother insisted on introducing her daughter with an anglicized version of her last name, Anaya would often correct her mother and others with the Spanish pronunciation. Much to her mother's chagrin, she continued to seek out books written by Mexican or Mexican-American authors, plunging into an imagined adolescence that Anaya felt had been taken from her by her mother's choices, not only to leave Mexico, but to erase their culture by marrying Robert. Over the course of Anaya's teenage years, she and her mother grew further and further apart. When Anaya enrolled herself in Spanish classes in high school, her mother pulled her out and insisted her daughter enroll in French instead. Whenever Anaya had the chance to do research about her family and culture for a school project, she and her mother would fight. Why can't you just let them go, Anaya, her mother would say in exasperation. Let my culture go, my people? What are you asking me, mommy? To get whitewashed like you? And Anna would, Anaya would shoot back. Back and forth, the two would argue. Anaya's mother insisting her daughter was American. Anaya insisting she was Oaxacan. Anaya criticized her mother when she became the CEO of her own business for becoming too capitalistic and corporate. Anaya's mother criticized her daughter for her choice in food, clothing, and her insistence on decorating her room like it was always El Dia de los Muertos. By the time she was 18, Anaya couldn't wait to move to Phoenix to attend Arizona State University. Her mother had been reluctant to support her daughter's decision to go to college, mostly because she found out through reading her application that her daughter planned to double major in Chicana history and anthropology. That summer was the last time Anaya and her mother would live under the same roof. And rather than be a time to enjoy one another, the two had been bickering almost nonstop. When they fought, the mole sauce simmered and was now threatening to boil over. Anaya quickly turned off the stove and spun around to face her mother. Anaya stood there in the kitchen, her favorite room in their house, and held her mother's gaze defiantly. Her mother walked over to the stove and spooned some of Anaya's mole into her mouth gingerly. Hmm, she said, her black eyebrows knitting together. Though her mother had been dyeing her hair lighter and lighter each year, she usually forgot her eyebrows, something for which Anaya was grateful. Her brows and the rich chocolate brown of her mother's eyes were among the most visceral reminders of their culture. This sauce, she said, avoiding the word mole deliberately, doesn't even taste good. You see, Anaya, you're not even a good Oaxacan cook. Maybe stick to cupcakes, okay? Her mother turned on her heel and walked out the door. Anaya returned to her onions, allowing the flood of tears to take her over. So that's the kind of first part of the book is all of the characters and myself experiencing this need to choose. Okay, am I, am I anglicized enough? Am I American enough? Or am I Iranian? Choosing one side or the other of the hyphen and kind of the role of our families and all of that. As the book progresses, people, you see the people, the characters, myself included, finding belonging and creating something else something in between, something beyond between, something that is crossing over, which is what I see the hyphen is being. So I think I'll stop there and David, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for such a stimulating overview of your, of your work. Really, I, it, it's, it really, she resonated so much with, 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 I'm sure many of us have struggled with similar issues, but not nearly as articulately um, uh, and as interestingly as, as, as you have. I, mean, I think I might just sort of start things off a bit by saying, if you had written that book, as it were, before your other ones, would it have changed your earlier writings in the way that you approached your ethnographic expression? I mean, that would be a very interesting thing for us to, us to learn, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think it would have absolutely changed the pre terrain right? So I think it would have changed the way in which I entered the field, right? I think that, I think, you know, that, that lens, right, that, 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 you know, that is often talked about with, when, when discussion, you know, Peter Pels talks about the pre-terrain, um, what drove me, you know, into that pre-terrain, what drove me into those fields. I think one of the things that drove me into my, you know, first book, certainly, was a quest for understanding myself. And I thought, okay, I'm going to fit over in Iran. So I, I actually became an anthropologist to study Iran because I thought that that would help me find belonging. And so the pre, you know, as I think about the post-terrain now, 
that pre-terrain was really, you know, it was really about uh, understanding of, of, of myself. And so I went to Iran uh, trying to say, okay, I don't, I've never fit in America, right? My parents came here during the revolution. I grew up here in the United States, um, but I never fit in. And so for me, going to Iran to do field work and, and that, the work that, that, that went into that first book, that was about me trying to find belonging in Iran. When I was kicked out of Iran, there was that moment of existential crisis. I still wasn't ready to say, okay, maybe I'm something else altogether. Um, I, I continued to do field work in, in, in the Middle East, stationing myself in Dubai and, and Kuwait. And so I think that, you know, again, the pre-terrain was colored by this absolute drive and desire to, to belong, as opposed to looking at, at the hyphen itself. I was still trying, like, trying to fit on one side or the other of the hyphen, right? Like, I'm this or I'm that, you know, and one, of, one of the, you know, characters in the book who I call Adachike, trying to be, I'm no, I'm Nigerian, I'm not American. And then, oh, maybe I'm more American, you know, trying to fit yourselves into these molds. I do think as an anthropologist, those molds, that question of belonging, that question of, you know, I love Leila Abu how native is the native anthropologist? You know, you go to the field and you realize like, I'm not actually, and you know, I'm a halfy that, you know, as Abu Lukhod writes, he's a halfy anthropologist. I think going to the field, starts to also make you question that belonging, but the pre-terrain is absolutely inspired by a desire to belong. Yes, 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 I, I, I oh, goodness me, yes, I, I completely sympathize with what you say. I mean, the, many of the people I've worked with um, say this is partly a function of distance. They, they say that they belong half in Turkey and half in Germany. And when they go to Germany, they miss Turkey, of course. And when they go to Turkey, they miss Germany. And so they really have no answer. To, to this to this dilemma but but um i see there are some questions from the floor um it's slightly helpful if you're going to write them down please if you would kindly put them in the q a box although we can try and manage them in the chat um the 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 the, the first one was from a gentleman whose hands gone up and down and disappeared it's uh, jeffrey ben nathan did you want to ask something uh, you're most welcome if you would although your hand's gone down now or maybe that was just an accident um go ahead if you would or um, well, whilst we're waiting for that, Paul Basu has his hand up. So why don't we go to Paul? So please go ahead, Paul. Ah, there we go. I'm, I think Wonderful. I'm unmuted nice now. <laughs> Hello. Going now. Hi there, guys. Good Thanks so much. That sounds like a, a really uh, fascinating book. I love this. Um, you know, in between this, between uh, orthography and anthropology, it's uh, really great. And as a fellow dweller of the hyphen and uh, explorer of the in between, I was really interested in uh, you know what you're you're talking about. I suppose my question is about this journey that you're describing. Um, you know, where the the hyphen is the the the, the step in a journey to something other. And I'm just, um, I suppose, I'm wondering about actually whether that kind of structure um, of relegating the hyphen to this in between, this liminal moment is, um, well, I'm not sure it's my experience or whether I wonder if I value actually the uncertainty of the, the, the hyphen and whether actually dwelling in the hyphen, sticking with the hyphen as it were, sticking with the trouble to uh, <laughs> borrow a phrase, is uh, has its own kind of value that kind of rather than feeling uh, that new um consolidated coherent sense of self that you're describing as this kind of end point whether we actually lose something in that that actually it's good to be uncertain and untroubled um that the hyphen uh, seems to kind of suggest and particularly the multi hyphenate that you're describing i think that's really interesting that's an excellent, I mean, thank you, Paul, and, and glad to hear that, you know, you, you resonate in that in between. I, I think that, you know, I think it's, first of all, when we look at the orthography, right, there are words that the hyphen sometimes will never get pulled out of, right, or, or, or well, maybe will, but, but most likely won't. And then there are words that were hyphenated and never came together. So let me give you some example. And then there are words that ha some people use hyphens on and some people don't. So email. How many of you write email like a lot, right? So it, it used to be 
E hyphen male, right? It was E space <laughs> male, then it was E hyphen male. And now some people just write it as email, right? Um, there, are, there are certain words that people, orthographers lar largely agree, the hyphen will likely not be taken out of. For instance, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, mother-in-law. Um, so there are some words that the hyphen will will kind of will kind of stay in people think. Now I want to talk about you know your question is the hyphen really kind of a troubled space and I think I think many of us saw it as a troubled space and I but I think looking at the journey and the power of the or of the hyphen of the orthography to create new things whether you stay in that hyphen or whether that hyphen is bringing you something new altogether. I think that instead of seeing the hyphen as a troubled place, what I wanted to do with the book is, is shift that paradigm and, and look at it as a space of power, right? As a space of openness and creativity, right? Where it can be what you want it to be. So instead of constantly trying to fit yourself into a box or a mold, that you actually experience a release or a freedom of creativity that perhaps you didn't have when you were feeling that neither here nor there nor there that liminal betwixt and between yeah i suppose i suppose it's that it's it's actually that very thing that i feel the the, the work and it's not a tr it's troubled as a good thing it's yes. the productivity yes. the creativity of the troubled i suppose which um, i identify with the with with the hyphen rather yes. than the resolution that you're describing but you know i i get your point entirely it's, yeah it's great to to think about that well, and I think as we think about the politics of the moment we live in, right? So, you know, you've got identity groups where hy the hyphen has been dropped, right? So the Jap Japanese American was the first to drop it during World War II because there was this question of divided loyalties, right? And so that question of the hyphen, a, a hyphenated person as being someone with divided loyalties, I think is a really salient question for our times today. So I'm, I'm trying to reframe that. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. Well, well thank you. And, and we do have another person with their hand up. So let's go to go to them straight away, rather than keeping them waiting. And it's Soraya Tremaine from Oxford. Um, are you able to connect? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Hi. Hello, Paris, how are you? Hi, good to see you. Well, good to hear you. Uh, thank you. Well, it was good to hear you. <laughs> and thank you. And as you know, I am familiar, very familiar with your work, all your work. And I think you have done magnificent ethnography wherever you have done work. Um, Thank you, inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always enjoyed reading all your work. I, what I was thinking was uh, this question of, um, obviously you have tried to make very good sense of your own personal experience of field work originally in that where is what is your position as an anthropologist basically who is an insider and outsider at the same time which is very much a problem of anthropologists anyway but with an over layer of having been a native who has not been brought up in Iran right <laughs> this is that is why I was always thinking maybe this is a generational problem I think back from before the revolution when somebody like Brian Spooner went to Iran and immediately was labeled as a spy. Right. We have the Iranian anthropologists like Sohaila Shahshani who went to do studies in her own among the Mamasanis immediately. People, we all have done, I have done over 40 years of field work in Iran. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering that it cannot be this a generational thing really. It is in a way a search for your identity ah, as an anthropologist, Iranian, non-Iranian. And I wonder um, how um, widespread is your personal experience among other anthropologists of Iran? Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, Lara Deeb has a book actually that's, uh, it's, I think it's called, Anthrop you probably know it, Anthropology Politics. It's about Middle Eastern anthropologists. So not just anthropologists of Iran, but anthropologists of the Middle East. So it's, it's Arab Americans, Iranian Americans that they focus on in that book. Yeah. So I, I didn't focus my study for this on Iranian, Iranian American or Iranian British anthropologists or even anthropologists of Iran. Um, I, I was really uh, looking, you know, I, I, I of course read that book. I'm, I'm a, an interlocutor in that book. 
Um, and, and then, you know, as, as, as many of us have, you know, those of us who study Iran, you know, we get together, of course, as you know, and, and we contemplate and we talk about where are the fractures, you know, I, I think about, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, several folks who went in, I'm thinking about like Bill Beeman and, and how Bill, Bill Beeman was received as an anthropologist in Iran in such a different way than I, or, you know, Roxanne Varzi was mm -hmm. received, right? Yeah. And, and then there's that question of the reception of the anthropologist and, and kind of that gaze, right? It's, and he was received it like, you know, the red carpet was rolled out for him, right? In a way that it certainly wasn't uh, for, for, for many of us. And, and, and I've, I've wondered that question of the generational. I've also wondered the question of, of gender. I've also wondered the question of ethnicity, right? And, you know, I think for me, I, I thought I would be more of an insider going there. And I realized I was actually much more of an outsider when I went there, to your point. Um, but I but I really do take, you know, Leila Abulufo's work that that the Hafi can be a really interesting position and perspective from which to write. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that I think our identities as anthropologists, I think our identities affect the ethnographic pre-terrain more than we typically disclose or write about as our methodological vantage point. So while I haven't interviewed anthropologists of Iran in particular, I've certainly, you know, over the years spoken with a lot of anthropologists who see themselves as hyphenated anthropologists, many of whom go quote unquote home to do field work. I'm thinking a lot of my, my friends and colleagues, you know, when I was at Columbia who did field work in India, right? Who identify as Indian American you know, and then, and we're doing field work in India. And there's that question of, of going home. There's also the politics of like, you know, there, there was a turn in anthropology as we all know, right? You know, who gets to go, who gets to do the field work, who gets to speak for, right? The politics of representation. And so one of the questions I've been asking myself is we even have to step back before that and, and, and live in that ethnographic pre-terrain for a moment longer than we're comfortable doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, please do feel free to put your hand up if you would like to ask your, your, your question uh, live. That's absolutely no problem at all. But we've had a few questions put in the chat. So why don't we turn to, to those whilst uh, colleagues are thinking about that. And Gary Marvin uh, says, um, as well as saying thank you, he says, uh, some of us define uh, uh, work with human and other animals, that the sort of work that he does is human animal studies, yeah. with the hyphen not only simply indicating words that belong together, but with the hyphen indicating a place or a space of coming together, connected lives. It's a little bit similar to Paul's question, but I don't know whether you want to think about that in terms of human-animal uh, relations at all. I, I, I am, you know, a, a hyphen, a hyphenophile, right? I think that the hyphen can be used in many ways. What, one of the interlocutors that is introduced in my book is someone who identified, he, you know, I, when, I, when I met him, he, he said, I, I'm a hyphen in American. I said, oh, what, where's, what is your hyphen? He said, I'm rural American. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I, that was not one that I had thought, but I, I, I can see the hyphen connecting so many different things. And so why not human animal? And I, and I, I think that um, the power of that is, is that how it brings things together that you may not, have thought about like human animal ethnography. It's an interesting, like it, it's an interesting marker that can bring together. You know, I, I, I am more of the, in the sort of, you know, camp of, of hyphen, not as divider, but as connector. And then, and, and really, so there's the, you know, there's the two main camps, hyphen as divider, hyphen as connector. And I'm definitely more in the second, but, but I'm trying to introduce a third camp, which is like hyphen as, as creator of, of something else entirely. And, and so I can see that, you know, human animal, I'm an avid equestrian. I, my connection with my horse, you know, with my Palomino gelding is stronger than my connection with almost any human other than my children. Um, so, you know, I, I, can see, I can see that as being a really interesting space. I hadn't thought of it, but I, I can see that as being a really interesting space um, and, and one that I'd love to, to think more with you uh, about in terms of, of the power, not only of the power of it as connector, but as creator. Yes, and in this country, d dogs would be an obvious one. 
Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Gary, um, I don't know whether you, you have a live connection. Do you want to ask our speaker a bit more about that topic? You're most welcome to if you would. Um, I don't know if you would just put your hand up, perhaps. Hmm. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Perhaps while Gary's thinking about his his his. Okay, his no problem. <laughs> his hand is up now. Oh, um, so I am going to allow him to speak now. Yeah, great. If you could, if, if Gary wants to speak, he's always welcome. Yeah, I mean, it was. Um, thank you. It's thought provoking. Um, you know, this field that I, I mean, it's to the side of what you're talking about, but we who work in human animal studies deliberately use that hyphen to say to indicate a connection and again yeah. i think you brought it up somewhere else is 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 what is created in that hyphen you know what are the lives human and animal are brought together you know like horse rider I and mean, there is and we're de deliberately use it, it not as separation but a coming together so it's really just an extending <clears throat> of the thought more perhaps more serious things that you're talking about about human identities but animals this is my area of study animals are important in human lives and therefore this thinking about using a hyphen i think indicates the seriousness and, and complexity just that's the only point yeah no, i agree 100 percent here well th thank you very much gary uh, it's nice to hear from you and then we have a follow-up question from that where G.F. Taylor says, I echo Gary in thanking you, but I have a question. What are the echoes of the hyphen in languages beyond English? Perhaps you could start with Persian. <laughs> We've got our, our we, so, so I, I'll let you jump in here with, with, with that, um, or with Persian, because her Persian is definitely probably better than mine. I know Atisha is on here too, y'all should jump in. Um, I, you know, I started with the Greeks for a reason. Uh, well, not only because Dionysus Thrax invented the hyphen, in, you know, um, but because it, Greek, Latin, and then of course you see it in the, in the Roman. So, you know, certainly in, in that language grouping, you see the hyphen as, as very salient because of its history. Um, and, and because it is trying to create different signals. You had the dots for a time, any of you probably go to, you know, you've visited Roman temples, you had the dots, right? You had the different, different markers. And I think that it is salient to, to think about you know, where it started from and, and, and why. Um, I do think languages like, like Persian are, have a different rhythm or more melodious sounding naturally, right? So this, you know, the hyphen was invented to, to help those who are speaking, singing, right? By Dionysus Thrax. Um, I think that Persian, the way it's, it's sort of the intonations and the way that it's, it's written um, the words kind of come together in different ways. Um, but of course, there are hyphens, of course, in, in, in Persian, and there are hyphens, you know, in, in Arabic. Um, that question, though, of the hyphen as a divider or connector was not one that I, I heard agonized as much over when I was doing fieldwork in Iran. But I invite my colleagues to jump in. Um, not that there aren't hyphenated folks in Iran, there very much are. Um, but as you think about the history of the hyphen in places like the US and the UK and, and World War II being that really lightning bolt moment of anti-hyphenism, um, I, I think that that, that that was where, you know, I became interested in that sort of that tortured, you know, what made the hyphen become this tortured thing or this thing that divides and this, this tiny orthographical marker that was seen as something that was such a threat that you actually had politicians and people going, you know, to court to say, take out the hyphen from the New York Times, take it off of the New York Historical Society. So I have a whole chapter about New York, New Hyphen York. Um, and, and really these controversies, and we may sit here and, and kind of chuckle a little bit, but, but these controversies were raging in the UK and the US uh, in, in World War II, uh, uh, you know, ripping out the hyphen a, 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 as, as much as you possibly could, where, where as I looked in and throughout history, you didn't see that same huge controversy, let's say, it, f around, you know, hyphen, the hyphen in Persian. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, we have it. Um, uh, Farzan Ilich has their hand up. We'll go to you. But first of all, Soraya, you've been invited to comment if you wish. 
on the intricacies of Persian and the hyphen. Would, would you like to say a word? Please well, I, I really don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really given the question very much thought, so Padis herself is in a much better position to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you heard that, you know, it's just, it's not, it, it's not something that was discussed as much in Iran. When you look at the vast amount of archival material and even material till today, right? The, 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 like I said, this SOE disorder, Oxford English Dictionary that came out in 2006, created an eruption in the media everywhere um, around the uh, controversies around the hyphen. You don't have that same, um, you know, uh, uh, debates around this particular orthographic mark. In, yeah, in, in, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That's that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it'll come. Now we <laughs> put it out there. <laughs> I have to think about it because more than thinking about the actual language in hyphen, I was thinking of you as the hyphen. <laughs> In, in yeah, yeah. Iranian society, absolutely. You know, it's just uh, very, very interesting. The, uh, uh, intensely personal experiences we go through. Uh, for example, when I did field work in small cities, um, I don't look the slightest bit for those who know me like an American or a Westerner, but people always said to me, are you American? And after a while I, I said, well, why are you saying that? I mean, my Persian is better than yours. I don't, I look like you. But what they were really saying was you're not one of us. Yeah, you don't belong. <laughs> but it, it also gives you an advantage on the margin, you know, to be able yeah. to sort of, in that sense, you know, you are actually looking at people, you are accepted more even by men. I mean, you, you raise the question of gender, for example. As an American that I was, I had easier access to men, obviously, to talk about them than just, just being among the women. So in that sense, you were connecting as an outsider on the margin much more with, with the society than it. But our language was, I have to think about it. The Iranian Persian language has changed so much as well, as you know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> but I would agree with, with in terms of like, that question of the hyphen plays a, lot, a major role in the identity of those of us who are Iranian hyphen something right? Especially when we're in Iran. But I would say it also, I, I feel it here. You know, when, when I walk into a room, uh, particularly in, in leadership, I walk into a room and people say, where are you from? And I say, hi, I'm a, I'm a dean at Arizona State University. And they say, no, no, no. And, and they don't ask anyone else this at the table. They, and I, I, I don't know if any of you hear any kind of accent in my English. I don't feel like I have one. And people, well, where are you from? Well, where you're not from, you're not from Arizona though. Where are you really from? Where are you from? Well, I was born in Minnesota. Well, where are you really from? Well, I grew up in Cal, you know, it, many of us can resonate with that, right? It's like, they can't accept it until you say, I'm originally from Iran. <laughs> that's, that's very true, absolutely. But I, as I say, one becomes a bit marginal to every society, but you can actually uh, bank on that, on the marginality, you know? Yes. And that's what that's exactly what this book is about is like, mm. yeah, we can take that as as a marginalization or we can take that as a creative position. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. So um, um, I, I think, you know, um, a lot of anthropologists of Iran, even young, your generation, I am several generations before you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but even whole, there's like three more after me. I feel <laughs> like I'm like. I'm like, oh, now you've got the young generation. <laughs> but even the ones who are now go to Iran, you know, they have got this various experiences. It, I mean, as everything in Iran, it depends on who you know rather than what you know. Totally. And uh, therefore, the way you approach things, you work with people. I've been going back to Iran all the time, all these years before and after the revolution, and have worked actually with with people who are in power, the authorities, but it's the way you approach them, I think, that um, even in the end makes you connected. And I that's agree. what anthropological skill does for you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we, li it, it, we live in the betwixt and between, and rather than be tortured by it, let's use it creatively. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Vive well, la différence. <laughs> well, thank you very much, right? We, let, let's include Navarro's in, into the conversation. If, if we have a connection. Please go ahead.
I think there's a mute. Yeah, so far, okay. far then, I... All right. Got Great, it. go ahead. Okay. So, so on that creativity uh, note, I think, um, uh, and on a practical uh, uh, level, um, I'm wondering if there could be an emerging hyphenated person or people or creature that could help us deal with the current state of collective amnesia, which, which in fact is perpetuated and reinforced by academic rituals. You know, we are facing at least two forms of extinction uh, right now, and we have no idea what to do about it. And unless we disrupt this process, you know, we have, we have people on, in the US, we have, we have two groups who are uh, fully committed to their own half-truths, right? And, uh, and that, uh, you know, is, is a recipe for disaster. And uh, we somehow don't know how to come to terms with reality even. I, I hear you. I, I would I would invite our colleagues to jump in. That's that's probably a bit outside my expertise, um, but, but I hear you. Yeah, yeah that, that chimes in with something I've been thinking as well, which which is clearly there are many cases where what you describe appears what you what you describe appears to encapsulate a great deal of the identity negotiations which are taking place, but of course. There are also very systematic attempts where people who have that potential to draw on different backgrounds opt instead for a third one. And I think perhaps that also is behind Fazin's question. I mean, if, 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 if um, and there are also major nation state building initiatives long before Roosevelt's where they try to do the same thing. The French Revolution is an obvious one and also the Turkish Foundation of the Turkish Republic is one as well. But there the message is quite simple. You can have a, you can have ethnically, you can have a, a, a Kurdish mother and a Turkish father. It doesn't matter at all. You simply become Turkish citizens. And this was astonishingly successful for, oh, for, for certainly for five or six decades. And then only in the 1980s did it begin to get unpicked. And people began to be a little bit more self-aware and more explicit about the multiplicity of their ethnic backgrounds. And now it's talked about much more openly. But even today, there is an idea that there is something else you can jump to if you wish to, rather than, than emphasizing a, a particular, um, a particular uh, communal background. And of course, in Islam more widely, it can simply, uh, of course, people can also simply uh, join, join the Muslim faith in, in, an explicit, in an explicit manner, which is also a very useful way of where the, the common phrase is, uh, there are no foreigners within Islam, is, is a very, very common phrase, which I'm sure you, you're very, very familiar with. So yes, I think the question is, is there a way out of this of this dilemma, the one or the other, into into a further space? I think that's be very interesting to hear you speculate on that. Yeah. Well, look, I think I think one of the power and the beauty. I mean, and you started speaking to this as well, David. You know, one of the powers and beauties of the hyphen is that um, it doesn't have to be just around ethnic. Like, so I think that the challenge with you know some of the narratives around. As you mentioned, you know Turkey and 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 this kind of wanting to you know, nation building and 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 really you know stories of, of of nationalism and then this question of 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 divided loyalties. One of the things that I found really salient in the research I was doing is that almost at least in my field work, every, actually not almost everybody I interviewed, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of when you like, I would I would be sitting down with someone. And my assistant would walk by and be like, well, that's not a hyphenated person. I said, well, he identifies, he's, he identifies as Jewish American, gay American. Like people have different ways of identifying themselves. And, and then I, you know, I, I would have people who, who inserted other identities that you would have never thought of. But one of the things that was really interesting is when you brought people together for a focus group, they might be people who never would have thought, oh, wow, we both have this connection of sometimes feeling betwixt and between, even though maybe just the appearance or the ethnicity or the nationalism or the faith, the faith wouldn't suggest that, right? But many of us experience being hyphenated. And so that's actually something, not only is the hyphen as a connector of different parts of our identities, but the hyphen serves as a connector of us to others, to other humans. 
that we may not feel connected to. When we realize that hyphenism, that all being hyphenated in different ways, of course, we all share an experience of hyphenism, of betwixt and between, even though maybe at the face of it, you might not think someone I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing or talking with considers themselves as a hyphenate, right? Many people experience the in-between, almost everyone has, and that in and of itself can be a connector. And, and then maybe, you know, to come back to Farazine's question, it's like, we got to find these connections as we're facing extinction, right? I just have to let my son make in from school, um, so excuse me for a, a moment. But Carrie, I mean, the question is perhaps when it becomes part of a national identity and how many sub-identities we can just carry on mixing with until we have to plump for one or the other. Um, but I, I, I'll be back in just right. a moment. Well, and so that I think David, uh, David's not going to hear the answer to the question. But that I think that's where we go back to the orthography, actually. And we look and we see, OK, like, do we have to have hard and fast rules? Does email does email as a word always have to be written as E-M-A-I-L? Or can some people still hyphenate it? Yeah, some people can and do still hyphenate it. Um, way station is another really good example. Some people write way station one word, some people hyphenate it. There have to be hard and fast rules like there are with you know, ethno-nationalism. Maybe yes, maybe not. Can we look to the orthography to learn something new? Right. I mean, and, and, and then there are words that, you know, that the orthography without the hyphen, like it would they would have never come together. Right. Without that hyphen. So. So, David, I'm just saying that in answer to your question, I think we look to the orthography, particularly a word like email. Some people can write email with a hyphen. Some people don't. So you don't have to have this this hegemony of like you have to use hyphen. You don't have to use hyphen. I think the point of it is, is that where it resonates now, some cases it's the hyphen is useful. Some cases, the hyphen has been dropped because we know that these are two words that belong together, even though we don't put them together. Ice cream is a great example, right? Ice, space, cream. It, it, they played with the hyphen for a while and then they were like, no, nope, let's just keep them separate, right? There are two words that can be seen as belonging together. Bumblebee is a better one, right? Because you had bumble and then you had bee and then you've had the hyphen bringing them together. And then then just the rhythm of it, bubble B is one word, kind of that, because people don't use bumble as often, so that they brought bumble B together as, as one word. So it, it, it's also a living thing. I mean, people say, well, you know, orthography and ethnography, you know, ethnography is a, a living, sort of you're, you're talking to live living people that are ever evolving. Well, orthography is too, because we all know all our linguistic language is constantly evolving. So orthography has to constantly bend and shape and dance. Does it mean it's less relevant? No, orthography is using, is being used and is, is also a device to create new cultures, to create new ways of thinking, new discourses, new, new spoken words. Mm. So, so is there a changing history of a dual citizenship permission in America? Because I think many people do have dual citizenship at the moment, but has it always been permitted? Well, I, I think it depends on the country, right? You're, you're not supposed to have dual citizenship with Iran. All of you can jump in here, at least in the United States, you're not. Um, but there, but there, that's where you've got citizenship as being distinct from identity. So they stripped me of my Iranian citizenship when I was kicked out in 2007. Is that ever gonna make me stop identifying as an Iranian American? No, I'll never be an Iranian citizen, but I'm never gonna stop identifying as Iranian American. And so there you have something very useful. Right, so that, that no one can take away. Yeah, yeah that's very moving. Well, we've got more questions in 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 the chat, so we'll we'll go back back there now. Um, uh, Jonathan Skinner, uh, good evening, Jonathan. Uh, um, yes, so he would like to echo Joanna Overing's comment on anthropology being the bridgehead of communication, um, and can the hyphen reify the two and a middle path, a hybrid path. Um, uh, a bit betwixt and between us developed from this conversation. It's a little bit similar to the thoughts we've had before, but please go ahead if you would like to say anything about that. Well, I mean, can you, so is the question about the reification of the, of the space of the in-between, is that the question? If well, literally it's written here, can the hyphen reify the two, i.e. Uh, the... The, um, the two uh, on either side of the hyphen? Like, the, yes. this is supposed to be Iranian-American. 
So are you saying, are you saying, does the hyphen reify what's on either side of it? Or are you saying, is the conversation reifying the hyphen? That's my Good question. question. If you're here, Jonathan, you're welcome to jump in and ask your question live. Okay. So Jonathan actually had written in the chat just uh, a moment ago saying that he unfortunately had to leave. Oh, to okay. the page, so okay. he won't be able to clarify. Oh. Never mind. Thanks for that clarification, uh, Henin. But not to worry. We can, uh, Jonathan can always write later if he wishes to follow that. Absolutely. Up. He's got my so, email. Uh, so Jeffrey Ben Nathan says he would, he, there's an implication he would like to ask his question live. So do go ahead if you yes. would. Yes, please. please. So Jeffrey, I have allowed you to speak. You will need to unmute for that and then you can. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, lovely, good. Um, I got your book and enjoyed it very much indeed and read it from cover to cover. And so let's go to the very end. I love the idea that you make of the hyphen. By the way, I have a hyphenated name, so I live with I it. I see it, I love it. And um, th there's quite a bit of background to this, actually. I just contacted other members of the family and asked whether they use the hyphen or not. They all do. But um, two of the members, their fathers ran a shop, uh, an antique shop in New York. And it turns out that they had to, because of the matter that you mentioned, the uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and uh, 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 Theodore Roosevelt, at that time, pre-World War II, they had to take Ben Nathan and put it into Bentham. <laughs> and oh. the shop in New York was reduced. But you, I love the idea of the hyphen being the connector but in the end, as you say, being the creator. And at the end of your book, you have, I thought, a wonderful um, summary to the whole thing, a pluribus unum, the motto of the United States, that from the batch of identities, which everybody has, at the end of it, there comes out a wonderful single identity, which the Americans can benefit, the British benefit, everybody benefits. Um, so a pluribus, a pluribus unum, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, Jeffrey, for, for buying and reading the book. And I'm honored that it resonated with you. It was I love pleasure. the hyphen in your last name. I love it. My, my kids have hyphenated last names. Um, and, 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 and thank you for sharing your story of the experience in New York. I, I think that was, was the experience of, of many people. That, that I have spoken to uh, in New York, which is which is interesting. Um, yes, I, I'm actually quoting my, my, one of my interlocutors there. That 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 it sort of was uh, one of my interlocutors. Danny is uh, throughout the book. You you watch this individual um, begin as someone who identifies as a Chinese American man, then as a Chinese American uh, 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 gender non-conforming individual. And then as a Chinese American female by the end of the, of yes, the book. Yes. And, and, and she says, you know, at the end there, she says, look, I, I realized that I could be tortured by the many me's or I could embrace it out of the many me's comes this one wonderful me, yep. right? This Ipluribus Unum. And that was kind of that, that, that kind of connects back to what I was saying in, in answer to David's question, which is that the hyphen can be something that connects all of us because out of the many, many me's that we all have comes something else, which is, you know, I am, what am I? I am a multi-hyphenate, I am one. And that's something that, that, that many of us can connect to, right? That many of us in the UK, many of us in the United States, like, yeah, we all have these multi-hyphenate identities. And yet here we are out of the multiness comes something one and, and unified. And so, that for me was really salient. Like I said, when I had this really hard moment and Jeffrey, you'll have seen it in the book. I had this really hard moment in 2016, you know, during the election of Donald Trump, when, you know, uh, I was, I was living at Pomona college. My, my daughter, um, who is also Iranian American and knows a little bit about my story. She had, you know, she had come home from school and, and kids at school had said to her, well, you know, once Donald Trump is elected, you're going to have to go go where you came from. You're going to be sent back where you came from. And she's like, OK, where are we supposed to go? Because we can't go to Iran. Like, where is that place? Um, and, you know, I, at some point, someone threw a MAGA brick through our window. And, and, and you know, there was this moment of like, I, 
I am nobody because the sides of me are warring within, within each other. So it's this, it can be this torturous moment or it can be this moment of like, actually, no, I'm not this divided inside. I am this something out of the many me's comes one, comes mm -hmm. one that can be unified. And I think that's an experience that has helped many hyphenated folks connect to each other. Yes, I mean, if I can just say that, I, I think it's largely a question of who you're allowed to be in the society in which you live. And there's a quote I love, I, I could never find the source, but Queen Victoria greatly disliked um, Mr. Gladstone, his, her prime minister. And um, one day she said to him, Mr. Gladstone, it really doesn't matter what you think of me. What matters is what I think of you. And being as I am a member of the Jewish community, I hear so many Jews identify themselves as this, I'm that, I'm a socialist. I'm a, I say to them, it doesn't really matter what you think you are yourself. What matters is what society thinks about you. And um, I think that this is the overall question of being objective or subjective or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And um, one hopes that when you live in America and we live here in Britain, we live in a society in which we can all flourish and which uh, we're accepted and we can contribute. And I think we all do. So, but uh, one thing, if I may, David, it was just one, the, the particular characters are very interesting was Adichike and this mother and father. Um, it's the, the contrast was a very extreme of the mother who really wanted to celebrate everything Yoruba while she was in the United States and the father who wanted to be all American. Uh, but was this really a, a family that you, you, you met or was it? Absolutely, yeah, these are based on interviews and I interviewed the yeah. father many times yeah. uh, at, you know, at football games um, and, uh, and, and, and really watched that journey. Uh, I just wondered how a, 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 a family, a husband, a, a father and a mother could be at such extreme polarities in their move to the United States. Well, they're divorced. The mother. I mean, you, you see that, that, that he doesn't live with his father at the beginning yes. of the book, he yeah. lives with his mother. So perhaps that's why they divorced. I didn't, yeah, I didn't I think get so. into that's that component of it. But you see that he's living with his mother. And then, of course, when this, the tragedy happens and, and his mother passes away, then he's made to live with his father. Yeah. Um, and this is where he starts to get that whiplash. Yeah. Anyhow, I really enjoyed the book. Thank you very much indeed. It was Thank brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, th thank you very much for your question. I see there's one more in the chat, um, which is uh, from, from Liz, Liz Thompson. And she says, would the self-identification of a non-binary person reflect this hyphenated between or integration? Yeah, so thank you for that question, Liz. And that's that's the care, that's the character, who, I mean, interlocutor, but I call them care because I've changed their names. Um, that's Danny in the book, um, is someone who identified as non-binary for most of the field, for most of the period that I was doing the field work and, and writing the book. And actually. Um, and then you'll see there are several other folks in the book because of course, while I do focus on three, um, I introduce a number of others who are kind of, so they come in as sort of a peripheral and then they're supporting it. And, and yes, uh, uh, actually a number of the people that I interviewed. So I interviewed uh, uh, roughly 85 people for this book in particular, 85 uh, in-depth interviews, series of interviews with 85 people like over and over a period of time. And um, yes, the non-binary is absolutely seen as, as a hyphenated identity, that that is something that's taken up. Um, I have a piece uh, in, in, in actually in UK-based Times Higher Ed on the Council of Coalitions here at ASU. Um, I have a piece about that. And, and these are different coalitions of, of different identity groups. Um, actually, one of the, Anaya, who I introduced to you all, she was active in El Concilio, which is one of the groups in the coalition, but there's also the Rainbow Coalition. And, and so you'll see a, a description of, of the Rainbow Coalition and, and of folks who are identifying as non-binary who identify as hyphenated individuals. And actually some of, for them, they found that the, the non-binary, that, that component of being non-binary and having the hyphen as unifying that for them felt a lot more freeing, like in focus groups when people talked about that, the, the hyphen as creating something new that really resonated with them because like, we're just creating a new gender. Well, thank you very much. And we have two more people who'd like to ask a question live. Um, 
And the first one is, is Keshav Rajput. So thank you very much and we'll try and connect you. Uh, hello. Hi, Hi. Keshav. I'm an anthropologist from Indian University that did my master's in anthropology. So my, uh, can you hear me? Um, it's, it's just Am breaking up a bit on my end. David, is it, is it clear on your yes. end? Yes. Could you speak very clearly, please, Keshav? It's breaking up a little bit, we, but we can just about hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, am I audible and uh, clear now? Yes, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I, want, I want to ask about the, about Pydis. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, conversation uh, which I have here. I want to ask, can you give uh, an example of uh, hyphenating from daily life, from everyday life? Hi hyphenating in, in English, in everyday life? Yes. Uh, well, so email is a big one, but, 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 you know, I think, um, you know, some of the, many of us use, you know, well, I use pre-terrain, I use a hyphen there, and many of us do use pre-terrain and post-terrain, um, you know, many of us use hyphen for postdoc, some people do postdoc as one word, I, I think there are a number of, of um, words that are hyphen flexible, is what, what orthographers would say, right? You can use the hyphen or not, email being the most uh, popular one, and then there are words that always have a hyphen. Um, and then there are words where the autocorrect will take you out of the hyphen and you can still put it in. Um, so, you know, um, probably uh, when you're writing ages, if you're writing them out, a six year old, six year old is, is typically hyphenated. Um, uh, and like I said, that there are words that most of the orthographers and, and, and linguistic anthropologists and language experts I've talked to say will never be unhyphenated because words like ex husband or ex wife. People like that hyphen in there. They don't want it to be one word. <laughs> and, and leaving the X just by itself <clears throat> is not uh, uh, as, um, for, for the way in which we read a sentence, it's, it makes the X without the hyphen, the space, it makes it difficult to see the two as, as, as coming together. So a lot of this is coming from studies on, on how people interpret the written word, how people interpret the spoken word differently and what rhythms make sense, as I said, language is evolving constantly and, and language is making culture and culture is making language, et cetera. And orthography is a really important component to it. Well, well, I, think can I have uh, one more follow-up question. Can I go? Please go ahead. Can I go ahead? Uh, so it's about uh, when you said hyphenating is more like, uh, not like separating or connecting something. It's like, uh, like a creativity. So what the examples you just shared, it's more like uh, we are connecting two things. For example, email, for example, six years old, and other examples. They are like connecting, we are connecting here. How we are creating or being creative, in, creative here? Um, yeah, so I I, I I think I'm understanding the question of how, how it's creating. And, and <clears throat> that's where, again, <clears throat> the idea of the book is that the hyphen is creating new identities. So you don't have to say I'm Iranian or I'm American, but rather I'm an Iranian American. I'm a hyphenated person, which is creating something new altogether, not something that has to fit on one side or the other. And with words, it's the same. I, I, you heard me give the example of Bumblebee, Bumble space B, then it was Bumble hyphen B, and then a whole new word was created, which is Bumblebee. So you see it in, in, in the words, right? In the, in, the, in, the, in the creation of words, but also in the creation of, of identities. So that's where the creativity comes in. But also the, I think our friend was asking about the connectivity. So for example, when you say half eaten apple, the yeah. hyphen gets half and eaten. And then these two words connect the third word. Correct. Rather than divide, so it's not really, they, so it, it has the function of bringing together rather than dividing, even though that's it's a hyphen. Correct. Right, mm. and, 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 and that is what Dionysus Thrax intended, right? And so that's where, when people think about the politics of the hyphen, they usually only go back to World War II where there was this idea, the hyphen is a divider, right? That's why they had to take it out of New York Times. But that's why, that's why I'm saying you have to go back further. Happy Eaten Apple is an excellent example. That's exactly why Dionysus Thrax invented the hyphen. There we are, well, thank you for the question. Well, we've got one more here and perhaps as the, Poor question, the poor speaker has been, has been asking questions, answering questions for more than an hour now. We ought to 
we ought to um, allow her some relief. But there was a last person with a hand up, which is Katayun Medat. So please, please, please go ahead if we can connect you and ask your question. Um, hello, and thank you very much with your hyphen um, uh, philosophy, because it, it goes, I think, to the um, heart of an existential conundrum. Um, I, it's not so much a question, it's really a free association thing. And it goes back to what a previous um, person asking the question uh, said about subjectivity and objectivity. And I was thinking, who really are we in terms of identity definition? Who are we trying to oblige? Is it ourselves or is it others? Um, I mean, I'm very multi hyphenated and every I've given up. I've given up to define myself. I, I, um, dispensed with hyphens. I was also thinking that, for instance, in German, um, obviously one has hyphens and you will see that I've got an Iranian name and a German accent and I live in the UK and I did my fieldwork on the Navajo nation. So, um, ah. you know, so, so it'd be, uh, right. I, <laughs> but I was wondering, um, really, uh, is this hyper, this, this, this hyper hyphenation, I would almost call it, you know, there is a kind of, there is a tendency or a turn towards hyper hyphenation. Is that, does that reflect our quest for certainty? Is there a desperate, the more confusing things get, the more we try to def micro define them to get, um, to have the certainty. And then I was thinking, because I'm also a psychotherapist, Keats's negative, capability, which is the, the capacity to dwell in the gray zones and not to define. Um, do I make any sense at all? Yeah, for sure. No, no. And I, I wanted to give one example, which I found quite interesting, and that was in my field, field work on the Navajo Nation. Now, I don't look anything like a Navajo at all. But there was something about, I think, giving up on defining myself that I would, uh, I would, um, I did field research on the, um, on alcohol and drug rehabilitation on the, on the Navajo Nation. And so I would um, go into cultural education groups. And I ended up, uh, uh, there was one client who was a youth mountain youth, and then there was me and everyone else was Navajo. And one thing was that the Ute Mountain Ute who came from 20 miles up the road from Toyak was exactly as foreign in this, uh, amongst Navajo as I was. So we were both kind of outsiders, which I found interesting, but also that people never ever thought, I mean, people very often came and said, um, what tribe are you from? So they didn't think I was Navajo, but they thought I was something else. And I thought maybe it is just because I'd so much given up defining myself that I'm actually so comfortable, you know, that the payback was being so comfortable being nothing that almost it, it, it served some kind of, there was because I didn't, you know, I did not place myself. Anyway, this was a very long associate, free association. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. No, I mean, I think, I think your, 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 your observation and your comment and your, and your insights really dovetail with what Jeffrey uh, put for that, you know, that lovely Queen Victoria quote that I'm definitely going to look up, um, Jeffrey, which is, you know, does it, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what I think of you, it matters, you know, or what you think of me, it matters what I think of you. That question of like, well, to whom are we trying to prove things, right? And I think that, I, I think that part of it is ourselves and part of it is learn, it, you know, I, I, I well, the very first line in my book is it took me, it took being kicked out of my native country to wrap my limbs around the hyphen, you know, so it can, it, it's about, it's about ourselves, our own journeys, but it's also about, about finding those connections and those bridges to others. And that, that e pluribus unum, you know, with which I end the book. So you've got the first sentence of the book and the last sentence of the book trying to kind of connect, right? Which is that, you know, look, a lot of us are, are, are in this same place resonating in this beautiful orthographic mark is that something that can bring us together in a moment when we're in a, a highly fractured and divided society well thank you so much we as i explained we we've 
We've really been keeping you far longer than we should have done um, away from all your important people. Is there any final comment you'd like to make to leave us with before we wish everybody a good evening or a good morning, wherever they are? Uh, or a good day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I just think, I guess I, I, I'm glad to hear so with, that it's resonating with so many of you all. And, and, and I, I hope that you all, you know, as you write those hyphens throughout your day, that every now and then you pause and you think about what you're connecting as opposed to what you're dividing and what you're creating. There we are. A beautiful thought. Well, thank you so much. And, and Hanin, Amanda, thank you very much for your support. And we'll just wish everybody um, a very good day wherever they are. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming, Pardis. Uh, and thank you to our audience. I'm going to close the meeting now. Bye bye. Have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs>